Hi, I'm Natalia Munoz, the news director for Holyoke Media. Today we have with us Mari Castañeda, who is a professor of communications at the University of Massachusetts and a dean to be in September. Whether the university opens or not, you're still going to be a dean. Is this correct, Mari? Absolutely. Yes, <laughs> a dean of the Commonwealth Honors College at UMass Amherst. Um, first of all, congratulations. Gracias. Muchas gracias. I, so we're going through all these changes because of the pandemic. We are adapting. Uh, we're becoming, uh, uh, we're learning lessons on the go. And you mentioned something the other day when we were talking about how this pandemic has, has served as proof positive that not everybody needs to show up at a cubicle and spend eight hours there. A lot of people can work from home, a lot of working parents especially, especially for those who can, this has become uh, an option that before maybe they didn't feel comfortable asking for. Yeah, I mean, I think, of course, I mean, I think one of the challenges right now, because school is out and the kids are at home and parents are juggling working full time, plus also trying to be, um, you know, a teacher in many ways with their kids' educational, um, you know, studies and so forth. At the same time, it is presenting the fact that, you um, you know, the, the flexibility of work is also very, very possible that even when the kids go back to school, is there ways that companies, that even educational institutions, nonprofits can work in a, much, in a way that allows for more flexibility for people um, to have the kind of, um, you know, life in which they're able to do all the multiple things they need to do without it being so stressful. Because I think a lot of times having to show up to work at a certain time and come out a certain time and pick up the kids and so forth is a thing that creates a lot of stress. And in my experience, I've seen that when folks are able to have some of that flexibility, it makes a huge difference in not only their performance at the work that they're doing, but also their own sort of sense of satisfaction with the work, with their life, with the kids and so forth, that then allows them to really be the full people that they want to be. Um, and so can we create a more general flexible work environment um, that doesn't feel hostile but that feels supportive for folks in these variety of different ways so I think that yeah the the pandemic has definitely demonstrated that the work is still getting done in many ways um, and so there's ways of imagining that possibility in the future as well once the kids go back to school once people are working and it doesn't mean that of course people don't want to show up to the office a lot of people love the ability to be in community with their colleagues and so forth but it's really about how do we also create um, that flexibility uh, and a much more generous work environment. Uh, Professor Castaneda, Dr. Castaneda, you have studied communications. How is this pandemic influencing mass communications, mass media? I mean, that's a great question. I think that one of the things that we're seeing is that, of course, people are, are much more reliant and dependent on mass communications, both for information, for entertainment, uh, for just sort of having a, a sense of a little bit of escape from the world of what's going on so that in fact, the, the, particularly entertainment, uh, but also the news has been so critical. Um, at the same time, what we're also seeing is that folks are, there's only so much of the regular stuff that people tend to see in a more mainstream um, you know, uh, venue and are creating much more creative, are creating creative ways of engaging uh, with social media platforms and doing little videos uh, and even sometimes using it to be more creative and, um, you know, sort of do um, story time or, you know, also describe what's happening in their community, sort of community news type of things that are giving updates on what's going on as well. So there's a whole variety of different ways. And I wish that I actually had a lot of the more time to actually look at everything that's being produced because there's been there's so much being produced that is actually really amazing. It'd be great to try to figure out some way to document, archive it, uh, examine it, particularly from Latino communities that are doing a lot of this, this um, new creative way of engaging. And then when you talk about people creating more of their own media, how do you think that's going to impact then the corporate media? They're seeing, wow, we thought we were it. We were the only thing. And if they, just like the big conglomerates, you know, like ABC and CNN and, you know, Fox News. And it turns out that a lot of us already knew this community based media is actually a lot more popular or has grown in popularity at least. Yeah. And then, Go, go ahead. Mm -hmm. And so the people's stories, people's personal stories are not being shaped by somebody who's interpreting them, but by themselves. They're telling their own stories. And then down the line, 
have we seen this before in history? I know like in Puerto Rico, Bombay Plena is a way of spreading news. Uh, back before people had, you know, were writing, if people were just through song, they were spreading news. And this is in many cultures, not just the Puerto Rican culture. So do you see this sort of communications grabbing hold, taking root again, where uh, the local stories, local people, local media become very important to a community? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, I think there are multiple things happening at the same time. I mean, the, the, the reality, too, is that the, we are still within a political economic structure of how the media industry works in the United States, right? So that those conglomerates are still owning so much of the distribution platforms in which a lot of the content gets distributed and gets viewed by different kinds of people across the United States and the globe. However, at the same time, a lot of folks are not necessarily tuning in to like NBC at 7 p.m. on Thursday nights. Like they're not necessarily connecting to the old models of how we were consuming and watching television, for instance, and that in fact, it's much more all over the place where people are doing it um, at different hours of the day, are also, con are also watching, you know, like they call binge watching, you know, various different shows and so forth. And at the same time, folks are eager to look at more community-based uh, content. Um, and I think that part of it is just the distribution of how do we get that message out there? How do people know that that's going on? I think that uh, forwarding and, uh, and reposting and and sharing and so forth is one of the ways that then the word gets out that a particular um, new show or a particular you know story is being told but that otherwise we wouldn't necessarily be able to see it if it's posted but then no one shares it no one sees it no one you know, is forwarding it so I think that that's part of that challenge is making sure that people know that it does exist and once people know that it does exist then oftentimes folks are 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 more than happy to connect and being able to see it and so forth. But I think that that's also part of it is that folks are not waiting anymore for the content to be created elsewhere and are taking the reins themselves and wanting to create the content themselves. And we've already seen that a little while ago. I mean, of course, we, we have a long history with newsletters and newspapers, community newspapers have been such an important part of creating alternative venues for the kind of stories that don't make it into the mainstream that really are more local and that really address the issues and concern of local community members. Um, but also with the rise of YouTube, for instance, there were a lot of folks that were creating also community channels and using it as an opportunity to share st stories or viewpoints or investigative uh, stories of things that we're not necessarily seeing on a more mainstream level. Um, and so what's happening now is that the people are now not using long form, but also using Instagram or Twitter as another way of trying to get um, alternative viewpoints out there as well. So these other forms of communication, uh, for instance, uh, social media, the social media platforms, not they're not journalism platforms per se. These have become then other ways for people to share their stories, for news organizations also to promote their stories. And I wonder then, and this is a question for you. Are we seeing a change? Is this changing? Because not that long ago, we were all, a lot of us were, don't believe everything you see on social media, verify the source. And now we're kind of back to, uh, yeah, I saw this on my Facebook account, or I saw this on Instagram, or uh, somebody uh, tweeted out this thing. And now it, it's these social media platforms, which just a few months ago were being derided as not good sources of news information are now being seen as actually you're getting you're getting a lot of good information well i think it a lot of it has to do with the sources themselves right who are the people that are producing the content who are the people um that are that are also doing the stories that perhaps are not being told elsewhere and i think part of it is people believing those sources because they're trusted because they know them because they're familiar because a, a friend of theirs told them you know i i you know you really need to see this particular thing i mean you're right i mean i think that there's still problems with social media i mean a lot of the content is not necessarily reliable there's still some issues with um some of the stories that get promoted for instance like and I mean, actually, it wasn't so much the, the story that was being promoted just because it came at the national level about injecting, perhaps, you know. Uh, oh, no, that's you know. like, nobody inject nothing. Exactly. The only person who can inject something is a nurse or a doctor who's qualified. Oh, oh yeah, exactly. Or like stand in the sun and somehow it'll make the virus, you know, <laughs> die. You know, so forth. Is, but 
but I was going to say that the thing that was, I was talking to family and friends, but also watching, looking at Facebook and, and, um, and on social media, particularly Twitter and also Instagram, where people were really concerned about other people actually following that particular advice and, pe and people actually being worried about, I'm just, we got to make sure that we are really pr communicating that that's not okay. Please don't rely on that. Don't do that. Um, because I was, um, I was talking to someone who was saying like, no, there, there's some people that I know in my community that will say, oh, this is an alternative. This is something that we should use. Maybe we can, you know, this might be, have some truth to it. You know, un poquito, you know, is that going to make a big difference? And they're like, no, don't, don't use nothing. So, but, so that's the thing is that there's still a lot of that misinformation that is coming at a more national level that then, of course, people feel like, oh, you know, uh, maybe there's truth to it when there really is not any, any of that at all. But part of it has to do with the fact that folks are hungry for having someone to kind of lead and someone to have, you know, to really sort of lay out what are the alternatives, what are the ways that people really can take care of each other and so forth. And so there are competing stories and narratives that are taking place um, that, you know, that I think is still make, makes it challenging so that social media is not necessarily now we've moved to the other side where it's 100%, you know, truthful or we can believe everything it's saying. But I think part of it has to do with who are the sources that are sharing that. And even then, sometimes people don't necessarily even question that. You know, they're feeling like, well, your position, you know, gives you the authority to say that or, you know, um, you know, I, I'm desperate for something because I'm scared and I don't know what's going to happen. And at least this provides something that I feel I have some ownership to. I can do something about this. It's very easy, but it's something that could be deadly you know, as well. Right. So so I think that that's also part of the, the challenge. But in terms of what's happening with um with, commu you know, community level uh, stories and um, and sort of news that is capturing what is happening um, in the ways that people are dealing with this issue. Um, I think one of the things that people are doing is that there are examining who are the folks that are being interviewed, who are the folks that are being invited to the conversation. And that also makes a big difference, I think, uh, in terms of folks feeling like it's a reliable, trusted source that I can go to uh, and think about with regard to those particular issues. Okay. Um, so, go ahead. Thank no. You <laughs> No, I was going to say that, you know, for instance, I was just reading recently, someone was been, um, was just sort of doing like these mini, not even like a video story, just sort of writing um, their, their perception of what they're seeing in their, in their town with regards to how are folks dealing with the fact that there are multiple communities where the apartment complex are full of folks, and a lot of those folks are becoming ill with, the, with COVID. Um, and one of the things that's happening that people don't know that is not being covered at the national level is that some of those, those folks that are living in those apartment complex are families, but some of them are just folks that are able to cobble together an existence where they're able to at least share the rent together. But what's happening is in some cases, folks are saying, You're, you just got um, tested positive for the virus, you can't stay here anymore. And so those roommates are then being kicked out. A lot of them Latino, a lot of them immigrant uh, folks that are, and I was hearing about this in particular in the Boston area, that then folks were being kicked out of their homes no, with nowhere to go. Um, I haven't seen that story at a national level at all of like, how are folks grappling with the fact that within it's, it, everyone assumes that it's always just families that are living together, but there's a lot of situations because of the high cost of rent and the need to bring together different folks together to make a living and support and pay the rent that are not necessarily family members that then are having, are, 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 are struggling to try to figure out how to deal with the virus in that particular context. Um, and that response has been to you know, not always be as generous or, um, or welcoming, but instead telling people to leave and then them ending up in the streets and having nowhere to go. I just want to do a PSA public service announcement. Sure. The only people who are qualified to talk about how to take care of yourself are Dr. Fauci <laughs> <laughs> or your own medical doctor or nurse, your healthcare worker, nobody else. I mean, absolutely. And that's the thing is that I was actually talking to my mom, to my mom, and she was telling me that some folks in the community that she lives in um, were telling her, no, look, look, all you got to do is this. You know, there's like also some, um, you know, not just herbal indigenous ways of taking care of ourselves that has always been an important part of it. But some of it, she was saying, it's, it's not even rooted in the indigenous ways of taking care of ourselves. Some of it is like synthetic stuff that she was like, I'm not sure that's a good idea, but that folks are so desperate and so scared. And that's the, that's the problem. And so rather than relying on a doctor or don't want to go to a doctor because they don't have it, they don't have a doctor, they don't have health insurance. They feel like uh, the doctors are not necessarily always um, 
you know, culturally sensitive to who they are and their language issues and so forth, that then they don't get the, they don't get the information they need. So that's also part of the challenge is that, yeah, absolutely right. They should be going to just simply medical doctors and Dr. Fauci, but it turns out that some folks are still like not a hundred percent convinced that their best interest is, is there where it is. But part of it I think has to do also with the lack of communication. Um, yeah. I mean, I was told, you know, we, that just to gargle with, you know, warm, salty water, and that will keep the the COVID at bay. So I do it, but at least, but I'm not just relying on that. I'm also doing, you know, distancing from people. I used to wear a mask. I have gloves. I'm washing my hands all the time. Este, I'm kind of in my element because I'm like a germaphobe anyway. So yeah. I feel like finally the rest of the world has caught up. Yes, wash your hands, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. And actually, I was just watching the other day, um, there was a, he's like, um, I can't remember his name, I, I got to look it up, but he, he's like a, a, a banda cantante, you know, he, mm -hmm. and so his song was Lavate Las Manos. Yes, and so, yeah. Wash your hands. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, <laughs> but it's like this like, really great, like funky song, like they're dancing <laughs> to it. And, and he's talking about washing your hands and keeping the distance and so yeah. forth. And, like, and so that becomes a way of again, communicating, connecting with right. communities that speaks to them, that engages yeah. them and that, that yeah. they feel is, is speaking in a way that is not also, um, that, that's not just, you know, in terms of connecting culturally, but also that it feels like it's speaking to them rather right. than speaking down to them. Right. You know, which and, is also a difference. And there's also the, the, the late night comedians that they're, they're very popular on YouTube. You have uh, Trevor Noah, there's uh, Stephen Colbert, there's Conan O'Brien, there's Samantha B, uh, who are constantly talking about uh, COVID-19. It seems like their followings are usually young men, or mostly young men. There's some women also. But at least... That kind of communication is working, though the the this, their success on YouTube, where you know millions of people are watching them, uh, talk about how to take care of yourself, how do you wash your hands. Conan had a whole thing about washing your hands, also, and uh, that's also the how we are learning to get our information from. Like when comedians are your primary news source, what does that say about a society and how it views? A traditional news sources. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, I think I think the U.S. has a long history with with a challenging relationship with news that is not that's not recent. That has you know that's been around for a very long time, um, even dating back to that. In some ways, even the founding of the country. You know, because there were always these these issues about the the newspapers and the kind of coverage that they were doing and were they politically oriented or really trying to be objective and all those kinds of things that I think has continued on, you know, since then. But I think that it has become really problematic more now, now because people really do want to, um, want to believe the news, but also have challenges with it because you also have other news sources that see themselves as news, but really are, are promoting a political ideology. And so that's the difference is that there, there is this, you know, framework of news, but that in fact, they're, um, they're not necessarily really taking in multiple viewpoints and they're not necessarily bringing multiple different people to have a debate and discussion and, and really reason things out and examine things and look at all the different angles. That's not happening. Um, and that is happening in other news outlets that I think traditionally have really prided themselves on being able to do all that. Um, but these other voices have also so much ba financial backing that they're able to reach much more people through their advertising, through the ways in which they're um, you know, distributed across social media platforms, uh, the ways in which they become so much more very entertaining that people then want to watch them on television when in fact even their content is not necessarily the most reputable and yet still people are watching it because it feels more entertaining uh, and more interesting but the problem is that again it ends up following a, a political ideology that is, is oftentimes not necessarily in the best interest of the common good or the best interests of everyone involved. Um, and so that has really affected news as itself. And so then people more and more become really unable to figure out, well, which news source am I really supposed to follow? You know, which one am I supposed to trust? Yeah. Um, and of course the rise of the, the hashtag fake news and so forth has also made it even more difficult and troubling, you know, to be able to, um, to really understand that 
there's a lot of journalists that are really doing amazing good work that are really trying to look at the different components and different pieces and different issues from multiple perspectives, but also also giving fact and relying on science and a whole variety of different things to really demonstrate, no, this is really what's going on. But even when you demonstrate, you know, uh, a variety of different you know, data that they'll, you know, people will still challenge and say, well, that data is, you know, corrupt or that data is incorrect or that data is a problem. Uh, when in reality, uh, then, it, then you start really then questioning just the knowledge production itself, right? That the, the, the actual, you know, creation of, of knowledge then also is being challenged and also being, you know, uh, not viewed as completely being, um, whole, you know, whole or truthful. Well, why do we want to be entertained by news? I, I, thought, I thought that's what sports was for, or the cartoons, or Netflix. Part of it also has to do with thinking about, you know, how is the news supported, right? A lot of it, I mean, in the United States, the media system is, is advertiser supported. Right, it's even if it's advertiser supported, then it's it's dependent on as many people as possible watching whatever the news is, and so a lot of times the only way to attract people to watching the news is to make it, you know, like it's, that's why it's always had a lot of like the, the gore and you know it's sensationalism in, in some cases, not always, of course, but there's a lot more explicit graphics than maybe you might find in something that's more state sponsored or state supported. That doesn't necessarily mean that that then is the only alternative because even that could be a real problem in terms of state media itself. Um, but I think that these things are so much more intricately connected. It, it is hard and it's, I think it's hard for people to, um, to really just take the news as what it is. I mean, I honestly do not know <laughs> why people, you know, in terms of the psychology of why they want to be um, entertained by the news per se. But I think that if you have a kind of system that is, is about having people watching, not because of, of really trying to give them good information necessarily all the time, but it's, it's trying to make sure that the advertising dollars and the advertisers are reaching the audiences that you want, there's going to be a conflict of interest there. And so that's going to impact that on some level. And so, and that's something that's, I mean, that can be resolved, but I think it takes, you know, there's just, a, that's a, big, a bigger conversation and a bigger issue to try to address that itself. Um, but yeah, I mean, in terms of why people, I mean, you know, I think people want to be entertained all the time, no matter what. I mean, if we're thinking about, you know, like, <laughs> you know, being caught up in their, um, in their uh, being at home. I mean, I was thinking about the fact that there's so many beautiful books to read and to, and to be engaging with. And I mean, yes, there's a level of entertainment in some ways, but it's an entertainment of like depth or an entertainment of like, you know, thinking historically or thinking in terms of fiction. Um, and I think a lot of people are reading, but I think a lot more people are not necessarily reading per se and instead just you know, watching television or, or whatever, um, because it's, it's easier. It's also much more, um, there, there's so much, I think also the other piece is that there's so much going on that sometimes people just want to veg sometimes in front of the television. They don't necessarily want to have to think too hard because there's already too much thinking that's going on outside of regular life. Um, and it's hard. And so I think that's also part of, part of the challenge is that it becomes a form of escapism or it becomes a form of, of trying to disconnect uh, at least for a little while, given everything else that's going on in someone's life. Um, but the, the challenge with that is that, you know, how does that impact then real serious conversations about serious issues and, and our real democratic context? You know, it requires people to be informed. It requires for people to, to be engaged. It requires for people to really understand the complexities. And, you know, if they're not getting all the information, it becomes really hard to do that. 